Um, thanks everyone again. Welcome to our Mass Bike monthly meetup. We like to do these every month, um, hosted by our staff to kind of keep you updated as members and interested parties of what's going on at Mass Bike. We have a big purview. We almost have the impossible task of keeping track of biking issues throughout the whole Commonwealth. But that said, um, we also need to keep in touch with you and you need to keep in touch with us to say what's going on. So every month we have a different theme. Um, we started it earlier this year in the spring and it's been pretty popular. I'm proud to say that we've got a little over 30 participants in our um, viewing audience today. And it is like the end of August, the tail end of a hurricane and right in vacation season. So I'm appreciative that all of you are taking an hour of your lunch to get this update. This month's theme is legislation and state legislation in particular. Um, Mass Bike, I did mention, is a, as a big purview, um, but we don't do it alone and we do it with a lot of our partners, especially the legislative partners. So we've invited uh, reps and senators who are champions of the six bills that Mass Bike is pushing out. Um, you can track this on our massbike.org slash legislation page to find out full information. We have one pagers on all of these stock on all these bills. We have bill numbers, we have tracking that we can do, um, but we wanted to hear directly from the legislators themselves. So we invited um, our cast of characters. Um, before we get going though, a little bit of housekeeping, just for those of you who joined a little bit late, um, welcome of course. This is another Zoom meeting. So I'm gonna ask that folks stay muted the best that they can. We are gonna have Q and A after each section and then a grander Q and A. Um, towards the end. But if you are interested in asking a question in the middle of the presentation, we ask that you use the chat feature, which is at the bottom of your screen. You'll have the chat button, um, pop that up, and Jess and Crystal and myself will be monitoring it. We're going to ask about one or two questions per legislative topic, and then we'll have a grander Q&A towards the end, hopefully ending a little bit before 1 p.m. Um, this is being recorded, so thank you, Jess. So for uh, viewing and sharing afterwards, we will send this out with an email update. We're also gonna have a survey at the end too of how did you like today's talk? Um, with that, I'll also jump into, do you see this? Uh, our Bay State Bike Month? Okay, cool. So um, a quick pitch is that Bay State Bike Month is coming up in September. Yes, it is tough to do a Bay State Bike Month, during the COVID non-commuting times, usually Bay State Bike Month is a time when we all get our coworkers together, get our cities and towns together, get our biking teams and our co-ops together to have bikey events. Um, we are still pushing it forward. If you haven't followed yet, go to baystatebikemonth.org. There is a lot of activity going on, um, specifically along the Connecticut River Valley, specifically along the Cape, and a smattering in the greater Boston area. But we are looking for events to put on our calendar on our baystatebikemonth.org calendar. Um, we have a bunch of how-tos if you wanna run your own event. If you throw it on a calendar, we're gonna promote it. We're gonna put it on our social media. And this is a way for us to remember that biking, um, it's, it's a great way to incentivize new riders to come out, explore the new rail trails, just anything and everything bike related, please pay attention to baystatebikemonth.org. It's what we're gonna push this year. And we have a particular mass commute bike challenge happening where you can track your rides and we're gonna have um, competitions for friendly competitions for who can do the most rides. Um, to jump right into it, I mentioned we kind of have the impossible task at Mass Bike of tracking bikey stuff statewide, but I do wanna lay our core values out there to say this is what we look at um, when we're trying to pursue what is the importance of um, how we focus our meager resources to make sure that we're impacting your riding. Our main deal is that we want to lead um, where a lot of the resources are not being um, provided. We all know that the transportation network, the open space network, the health and wellness network is inequitable out there. So we're doing our damnedest to make sure that we're pushing um, the conversation on a state level to make sure that is front and center of a lens that we focus on. And we're focusing mass bike generally on a policies of funding and legislation, which is perfect for today's talk, the 35,000 foot view but our real purview is to connect the grassroots and the local and the official levels to make sure that your riding is impacted from the grander perspective. And we do like to focus on the ease of bike advocacy, um, education, engineering, encouragement, evaluation, and enforcement. Um, today's talk specifically about legislation, we're gonna be focusing on road safety. A lot of um, encouragement, evaluation, and enforcement side of things. 
Um, we're also going to be focusing on a, a swath of uh, electric bicycle related um, regulations and encouragement features, and then ways to encourage bike commuting in particular. Um, and then I should also mention, I forgot to say it, if you're down in the chat and you have yet to do so, please put down uh, where you are Zooming in from locally and uh, any biking that you want to talk about of interest that you are able to um, jump into. Um, so with that, I'm going to see um, with our list of legislators, I'm going to stop sharing in a second, but this is what we're going to run down. Um, and I'm going to ask Jess to to back me up here with the one pagers that we've created to throw into the chat for each of these. Um, and this is gonna be a very fast paced um, update. And um, here's the quick rundown. We're gonna have uh, Rep Sabadosa talk about the CPA funding, the Community Preservation Act funding that's gonna go into rail trails, which was passed into law, um, much due to her and her colleagues efforts uh, just a few weeks ago. We're gonna have Rep Batolo, um, talk about the commuter transit benefits, which is geared towards having pre-tax incentives for riding your bike um, to work from your employers. We're going to have Senator Di Domenico and Rep Owens talk about the electric bicycle definitions and uh, regulations. Um, we have a video from Rep Blay talking about the electric bicycle incentive program. Um, and then we're going to round out with Senator Brownsberger to talk some about the road safety bills. And I should also mention that these are the champions who were able to get today, but they are not alone in the work. All of these reps and senators are working with their colleagues to make sure that uh, these bills are moving forwards. Um, some have already been signed into law. So we'll also ask you to keep in touch with our massbike.org legislation page. So with that, I do wanna step back um, and welcome uh, Rep Lindsay Sabadosa. Um, Lindsay, if you are on, feel free to unmute and turn some video on and I will stop sharing. And Jess, I'll ask if you could help highlight the rep and we'll jump right in. Thank you so much. I am here and I was actually just about to put in the chat if you could um, enable screen sharing for me. There we go. I think I've got it. Sure, there we go. All right, so can you all see the picture that I'm sharing with you today? Yes. Thumbs up or anything? Awesome, okay, great. Always a, uh, always a moment where I wonder if this is actually gonna work. Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me here today. I have the uh, incredible honor of talking to you not about something that we're trying to do, but something that we already did. Uh, so that makes my talk a little bit easier. Um, and the legislation that I have been working on for quite a while, along with uh, Rep Gentile and Senator Eldridge, and, and I'm gonna say many, many others who've offered a tremendous amount of support and assistance, is legislation that would allow communities to use CP, um, CPA funds or Community Preservation Act funds to help with the purchase of right away of defunct rail trails. And the reason I'm sharing this picture with you today is because it shows you the town line between East Hampton and Southampton, a community that I represent. And you can see the people in East Hampton walking along their lovely rail trail. And then you can see the other side of the road in Southampton where there is no <laughs> rail trail. There is simply just a lot of old defunct rail. And this is something that I see on a regular basis, sadly, as I bike from Northampton to East Hampton and then have to take a very busy uh, road if I'm going to go downtown Southampton. Southampton has been fighting uh, to build this greenway for about 20 years now. And the legislation that we've been working on, it ended up passing in the budget. And I, I guess I just want to share a little bit of that story because it was a huge learning curve for me in how do you actually get something passed. And the bill had been filed last session. It didn't go anywhere. We tried to file it in many different ways as amendments to transportation bills and budgets and, and everything. And, and uh, you know, we got great feedback from House Ways and Means. They said, we really understand. I've sent this picture to the chair many times. I've promised him he can come on a bike ride as soon as uh, this is built. But I think what uh, fundamentally happened was at the end of session, we were just frustrated and we said, you know, why is this stalling? And so what we did was we brought everybody into the room. We brought MassDOT and EEA and the town officials in Southampton and um, really said, what 
do we need to change DOR? DOR was a huge proponent. Um, and we reworked the language of the bill so that we built consensus before it was filed this session. And I think it was an important um, an important strategy. Uh, it's still, you know, it, the governor put it in House One for us, and then we passed it in the House. It did not pass in the Senate budget. Um, so this was a, a House victory for us, but we had a, a tense moment worrying that it wasn't going to happen. But because of this, Southampton is going to have the money that it needs. Uh, I should say Southampton is very much a, a bedroom community. There's not a lot of, of industry. So using those CPA funds are really critical. Um, and Southampton will have the money that they need to, to purchase this right away. And we are working with MassDOT to get a grant. So hopefully in a few years time, I'll be able to come back and, and maybe in 30 seconds show you the picture of the completed Greenway and uh, have a lot of you come out and bike on this really, I think, will what will be a very beautiful trail. Great. Rep. Sabadosa, thank you so much. Um, it, first off, it's so inspiring to see this turned into law and the mechanism with which you were able to, um, one, get consensus of the administration and the legislators together to make sure that this was included um, and on the governor's radar, because we know we had support in, in both chambers and we knew that we were pushing it. And I think the idea of having the administration there really helped that trifecta seal the deal um, and, you know, we were a little bit biting our fingernails to make sure if it uh, made its way through. And uh, luckily, I shouldn't say luckily, uh, with your, you know, just persistence and um, friendliness, I think we were able to get everyone on the same page. So we, um, of the bills that we were talking about today, um, Rep. Sabados is, is actually um, the, the successful example of the sausage making machine um, and how it works. And I should have also prefaced a lot of this by saying each of these bills will have a different avenue um, that we're going to pursue to make sure that they become law. Um, so maybe one of the things that we can ask the legislators um, from here is uh, what are the avenues of this, this conversation moving forward and how can our, um, our members help that along? And if there are I, questions, oh yeah, please, Lindsay. Please. I just want to add the the other thing I forgot. The other um, stakeholder that came to the table to support this eventually was uh, the Mass Municipal Association, which was a huge uh, win. We had a lot of meetings with them to discuss it, and they finally said, "Yeah, this makes a lot of sense." Um, when we shared that with legislators, they kind of said, "Wait, the MMA supports it." Um, so it was uh, it was a big win, but it really just does speak to the fact that you need the whole coalition on board. Awesome. Yeah. Well. Definitely a round of applause. Um, if there are any questions for Rep. Sabadosa, please throw them in the chat. Um, we're gonna, you know, stall for a second um, before we jump on to the next bill. But if there's anything particularly for the rep, um, please throw it down. Or for those of you in the Southampton, Westfield, East Hampton area who are very excited about this connection, because I also wanna mention that this key piece in Southampton is going to be part of the 100 plus miles from Northampton to New Haven. Um, and then you connect up to the Mass Central Rail Trail to be part of the 108 miles from the Mass Central Rail Trail. So this will be part, a key, key component of the um, longest and most, uh, I would say, historically important rail trail in all of New England. Um, and without these key pieces, we all know that a rail trail and a network is only as good as its weakest link or as its gap. And so to be able to focus on the gap here and find every mechanism possible from our line of work at MassPike, we are so grateful to have this tool in our toolkit. Um, so with that, are there any questions for the rep? Um, props, okay, great. Um, Lindsay, thank you so much for all the continued work. And yes, um, we look forward to the ribbon cutting. That's gonna be my favorite. Okay, great. Um, I'll jump back into this. And so sorry to jump so much back and forth, everyone, but we are gonna um, switch a little bit to um, the commuter side of biking. Um, and Rep. Tommy Batolo, if you wouldn't mind unmuting yourself, and if you'd like to share your screen, feel free. But once you're on, jump right on in. I got nothing to share but my ugly mug. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I wanna begin by acknowledging um, in a strange way, um, my my uh, college partner, Galen Mook. Uh, yeah, Galen and I went to BU together. Um, strange tale indeed. Uh, and also uh, recognize my colleagues, uh, Senator DiDomenico, Rep. 
uh, Owens and Rep Sabadosa, and there may be another one who snuck on that I wasn't able to navigate through Zoom, but uh, hello to you. And also I've got a couple of constituents and friends, so hello to you. Uh, I wanna talk quickly about an act relative to commuter transit benefits and begin by acknowledging that an awful lot of bicycle commuters also um, use and appreciate mass transit. And frankly, a lot of riders of mass transit appreciate that um, folks who ride bicycles are their comrades. Uh, and, and this bill relates to both. And so the current commuter transit benefit tax deduction allows individuals to deduct, to deduct um, from their state taxes payments made through their easy pass tolls and weekly or monthly MBTA passes. And so this is one of the cases where legislation seemed to make sense at the time, and I'm sure it did, but in hindsight, it has several stacked inequities. So if you ride the T, but not often enough to justify having a pass, or if you can't put together enough money to buy a pass all at once, you don't get a deduction. And that makes even less sense now in an era of COVID where people are working from home sometimes, uh, as well as an era where, where a lot of people, uh, half of their commute is outside of MBTA hours. And if you live in an RTA region, you get nothing, right? How about if you ride a bus outside of the MBTA? How come you don't get to deduct? Well, this bill would fix that. Uh, but this bill also acknowledges um, that bicycles are used for commuting and we ought to think about uh, that as well. And so it does a couple of things that are important. Uh, the first thing is it says your bike share membership, blue bikes or what have you. Yeah, that's deductible. Um, and it also says your other bicycle costs, maintenance and purchasing is deductible. Now there's a limit, right? So you can't buy a $8,000 road bike and deduct the thing, not the whole thing anyway. Um, the limit is, I think it's uh, just about $1,000, maybe $1,200, I don't remember exactly. Um, so, so we don't have to worry about someone sort of overdoing it. Uh, and lastly, it reduces the threshold for eligibility from $150 per year to $50 per year, which is especially important um, for uh, things like Blue Bike, which are like 85 bucks a year. And if the threshold's 150, then you still wouldn't be able to take it. And so the big idea here is um, we allow folks who pay tolls in their automobiles to deduct those tolls, whether or not they're actually driving to or from work. Uh, we don't ask that question. If you pay a toll, it's deductible. And it seems to me that um, if you ride transit, that should be deductible, not just for monthly and weekly MBTA passes, but for all transit. Uh, and if you're using a bicycle to get around, that should also be deductible. Uh, so this is the bill. Uh, it is a money bill, right? This is a tax cut. This is Tommy Vitolo pushing a tax cut, which you won't hear very often, uh, but you'll hear today. And, um, and so we need to actually calculate just how much of a tax cut it is and understand um, its context in the rest of the budget. It turns out it's not very much of a tax cut. Um, we're not talking a ton of dollars here relative to the tens of billions of dollars that is the Massachusetts annual budget. Um, but we do need to get that calculation. Uh, and I've been working with House Ways and Means to try to sharpen the pencils and figure out and estimate on exactly uh, what this would look like and what added um, challenges the RTAs and MBTA would face in terms of reporting uh, and, and how to deal with um, the bicycle issues. Uh, are we just collecting receipts and how do we, how do we deal with all of that? But, but it's all manageable. Uh, these are all rational and reasonable things. And, uh, and, and in an era of 21st century commuting, our tax policy ought to reflect our priorities, which is not to generate more miles and miles of automobile congestion, but rather to help folks make other choices. So uh, happy to answer any questions, happy to have support. I also wanna shout out uh, my partner in the Senate, Senator Keenan, um, he's working it on the Senate side and he's, he's great on this issue and so many others. Uh, and so happy to, to answer any questions. I do wanna sort of um, cut off a question that Galen had suggested earlier, what you can do to help. Um, look, this bill has something for all districts in the Commonwealth, all House districts and all Senate districts have RTAs or MBTA. They all have folks who ride bikes to work. And that means that anybody could contact their representative, their Senator and say, hey, 
this is good for our district. This isn't just about somebody else. This is about us. Let's um, let's get on the stick on this one. Uh, so that's uh, that's the first thing I would recommend. And of course, if you have ideas, uh, I'd love to hear them. Uh, so so feel free to share them, and I'll put I'll even put my cell phone in the chat because that's the kind of fellow I am. So any other questions? Um, yeah. Tommy, thanks. Um, we got one question in the chat from Roger, who um, I don't know if you have this off the top of your head or if anybody else here does, but what the annual Massachusetts gas tax revenues are, and um, what else is it? how does the get the tax cut compare in magnitude? Oh, it's it's a it's a tiny tiny fraction. I mean, look, here's the way to think about it: if every single adult in if every single taxpayer filed the full deduction. Right, it's about a thousand dollars of deduction, but the income tax is five percent, so it's fifty bucks per filer is like the absolute maximum. If nobody was filing any of the deductions now, which is not true, some people are for for automobiles, and if every single tax filer was doing like a thousand dollars a year of of transit and bikes, then it it becomes as high as fifty dollars per taxpayer. That's the total absolute maximum, which is small. Right. And of course, the amount of deduction associated with with RTA and MBTA occasional riders or non pass holders and bicyclists is going to pale in comparison to the number of people who are ringing up that easy pass charge each and every day. They're coming up and down the pike or, or through a bridge and tunnel. So it's 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 small money, but it's money. And and the legislature is careful about about those sorts of commitments. So we are. Uh, going to have to figure out those dollars and and make sure we understand how they fit in. Um, but it's you know it's small money and 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 in a sense that makes it a little tricky, right? For most folks, um, fifty dollars isn't going to make or break uh, their experience. But but this is the tax policy we have. We use it in other ways. We ought to use it in this way too. Um, and you know, like my colleagues from from. Uh, parts of Mass farther from the state house are are always concerned about regional equity. And I got to be honest, sometimes I think they're blowing a little smoke, they're whining a little bit. But in this particular case, there's unquestionably a lack of regional equity because some MBTA riders get to deduct, but no RTA riders get to deduct. The the state law is shaped to provide a benefit to people in Boston Metro that people outside of Boston Metro aren't allowed to recover. And that's crazy. We should fix that, right? That's real regional equity. Awesome. Thanks, Tommy. That leads right to our, you know, our equity first conversation. So um, we're proud of you for filing this bill. And um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll keep Tommy around and you got his cell phone number. So uh, yeah. if you want to help um, crunch some of those numbers with Tommy, or at least, you know, just hit him up. Um, he's, he's, he's on vacation time. So uh, he's always here for you. I'm on vacation time, but but I'm at the office. Come on, Galen. I love it. Thanks, Tommy. Um, do stick around. We're gonna have some more Q and A at the end too, and we can always follow up with with the reps um, and senators' names. And also, again, props to Senator Keenan who couldn't make it. We invited the senator. He's um, is on vacation with his family right now. He's uh, um, the Norfolk and Plymouth side, but he's also the the bicameral support of Tommy's push here. Senator Keenan is really pushing this as well. So, um, thanks to you both for for getting this bill out there. Um, I'll do a quick share to keep us on track here. And thanks. For, wait, this is the wrong one. Sorry. Hold on one second. I am still learning how to do. Cool. Um, next up, we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about electric bicycles. So we have a suite of electric bicycle um, regulations and promotion that Mass Bike has been pursuing for the past couple of years. And one of the things we're noticing, it's a hot button issue. Um, it's also one of the most popular issues that's out there in getting new riders and barrier breakers out there for older adults, for folks who are starting to commute, for folks who are starting to go longer distances. But we noticed some deficiencies in the way that the state has defined electric bicycles and how we're promoting electric bicycles. So um, I'm going to pass it off to Senator Saldi Domenico um, and Rep. Steve Owens to talk a little bit about an act relative to electric bicycles. Um, and with that, I'll stop sharing and... Um, I don't know if you guys want to do it one after another. If you guys just want to jump on together, but um, Steve and Sal kind of want to pass it off to you both. 
Steve, you want to go? Uh, <laughs> oh, sure. I was going to defer to you because I'm new to this. Uh, if you uh, if you if you'd rather go first, but I got plenty to plenty to say on this. I will say just to to kind of connect this with the last two um, bills. Uh, you know, we have we've been talking about rail trails. We've been talking about commuting. Um, so I, where I represent uh, Watertown and uh, West and North Cambridge, we are building that link. And it's some of you have, may have been through the Watertown Cambridge Greenway, uh, even though it's not quite quite finished yet. Uh, we're building that link from the Minuteman commuter bikeway to uh, the Charles River and the bike paths there. That is uh, underway. It'll be for the most part off uh, off street and on the on the on the rail trails. So uh, and that I will admit um, is a long way for a, a casual bike rider like myself. Uh, so having uh, a little bit of an e assist uh, uh, is something that I think will encourage people to do uh, to do commuting, and that's why this bill uh, is so important. Because as you may know, being advocates, uh, the e bikes don't really exist in a sensible way in Massachusetts state law right now. Um, the the law is uh, designated, you know with the thought of uh, motorized scooters and mopeds and things like that in mind more than the pedal assists. And what this bill would do is create that class system of of, bike, of e-bikes that exists in, in so many other states, the class one, uh, two, and three, and allow uh, not just the, the state, but also municipalities to kind of regulate those independently of other motorized vehicles. So, you know, there will be no question, am I allowed to ride a pedal assist e-bike on the Paul Dudley White bike path or the Watertown Cambridge Greenway or the, so the answer will be finally, yes, absolutely you are, as opposed to, well, probably no one will stop you. <laughs> um, so I think that's something that's really important for the growth of e-bikes. And as you all know, um, you can't buy any bike anymore. They're so they're, they're, what, what's the old the old Yogi Berra saying is that it's, uh, nobody goes nobody buys them anymore, but because they're too popular, uh, you can't you can't get a uh, you can't get a, a, an e bike for uh, uh, for how many they've been selling. Um, so they've been increasingly popular. It's really um, important for again moving people off of uh, you know of these single occupancy vehicles. If I can you know have a little bit of help to arrive to work less sweaty because I've got a little bit of a boost up the hill. Um, that's something that's gonna, that's gonna help. Or if I can go a little bit further uh, because I have an e-bike, uh, that's gonna help. So that's why this, this bill is really important to set those standards, uh, to create e-bike as a class of vehicle uh, in, of its own in, in state law, I think is gonna really open up uh, a lot of possibilities, whether it's commuting or bike sharing or anything like that. And uh, Senator, happy to, to, to uh, yield the floor. <laughs> Yeah, no, you, you, you did a great job of the overview. I, I'll just add a couple of things. Um, you know, the fact that we have 42 states and Washington, D.C. as well, who have changed a lot to classify these bikes the way they should be classified, not as mopeds, not as, of course, my phone rings, I've been on mute the whole time. But uh, classifying as, as mopeds or scooters is really something that, that, that needs to be changed. And we talked a lot at the State House about trying to take cars off the road, trying to make sure people can you know, take advantage of other forms of transportation. Having e-bikes classified in this way will take more cars off the road because more people will, will be able to ride longer distances and do it in a, in a, in a way where they can see this as their, their primary form of transportation as opposed to just doing it as a recreation, you know, both recreation and getting to places that they need to be at. Doing, uh, you know, running errands, even taking kids to school or going to work. Uh, this is something that needs to be changed uh, we all know the e-bikes are not mopeds, they're not scooters, um, they, they are bicycles, uh, and the fact that we can make this change uh, and do the right thing, and I know, I want to think that Galen and, and Matt's bike, this has been filed several sessions. Uh, this is a common sense piece of legislation. Like most things, take a little time to get, get going, um, and we've had a couple of iterations of this as well going forward, but it really is uh, something that we can also have people aging and also taking advantage, as Galen said, um, you know, recreationally uh, riding bicycles. So this is so many benefits to this. It doesn't make any sense why we can't just pass this as a pretty much a common sense bill that we can get done as soon as possible. How I would, uh, what I would ask of all of you, um, people who support this bill, 
uh, we'll be writing to the chair of uh, transportation in both the House and the Senate. That's where the bill is right now. And asking them to uh, support this bill and get it out of committee and actually schedule a hearing, uh, you know, making sure we can get this done sooner rather than later and make sure people understand that this is an important piece of legislation for a whole host of reasons and primarily um, to make sure people have other options for transportation as well. So it's a pretty easy bill. Uh, we don't spend too much time on it. You know, Galen has been laser focused on this for many, many years, trying to make this uh, this change. And, and we've been uh, happy to this be the lead sponsor in the Senate with also my colleague, Rep. Steve Owens and uh, Dylan Fernandez as well in the House. So thank you very much. Awesome, Senator uh, and Rep, this is um, great to have your enthusiasm and support. And I just wanna echo uh, Sal's recommendation and we'll send this out with the recording afterwards too of how you can help um, with the emails of the Joint Transportation Committee. Um, super important to get this on their radar. There's a lot that the Transportation Committee is dealing with right now. Um, finance, MBTA, reshuffle, the RTA rebuild, um, and the bond bill um, for all the transportation projects. But this, to Sal's point, should be easy policy. And we came really close last session. Um, it was the first session that we put it in, and most bills don't go forward in their first session. So I thought we did a really damn good job of getting this out there and finding different mechanisms. Um, a little bit of how the sausage worked, sausage machine worked last go around is we had um, we had this front and center in the transportation committee. We brought it to um, uh, the both chambers really successfully, um, but then everything kind of slowed down and installed because of we were dealing with the pandemic and we got it really close to be put in the transportation bond bill. However, this is not a financial conversation. This is a policy conversation. So it didn't really belong in a bond bill push. So I was um, fine with, with how we have to kind of revamp it this session, but I'm very encouraged um, both Sal and Steve that, that we have some good momentum right now. Um, I also wanna give a particular thanks to Sal because he's my personal Senator. So I was able as a constituent, for those of you who are wondering how these bills get started, um, I called up Sal's office and started talking to his aides and was like, hey, we have a bill. Can you help put this out there? Um, and then we started working on it. And then from there, um, the Senator really kind of took hold to it. Um, and I also wanna mention a shout out to Rep Fernandez. Uh, when I first took this job about a little more than three years ago, I had a constituent from Oak Bluffs um, get in touch with, with Dylan um, and said, hey, we really wanna ban mopeds but we don't want to ban e-bikes. Can we do that? Um, and so the rep reached out to MassBike and said, can we? That's a good question. And so we looked into it and said, actually, legally, not really. They're really conflated because the bicycle with a motor is a bicycle with a motor. So then we had the conversation of how we can actually start to build this bill on the house side as well. So this comes from constituents. And I want to kind of elbow that a little bit in here for those of you who are paying attention of how do we get these bills up going, they really do start from the bottom sometimes um, and get involved with your offices. And to, to that effect, um, Senator, I, I'm really appreciative to be able to work with. Uh, well, at that point, Chris, who was in your office, really pushed this forward. And um, Chris loves e-bikes so much that he went and now has bought one himself um, yeah. to start riding. And then I, my last thing I'll say before I get off my soapbox here is I also wanna say from um, an equity standpoint, this is also really important for bike share to be able to get electric assist into the blue bike system. Um, the way that blue bikes works is that it's a multi-municipality conversation. Some municipalities are a little bit shy about introducing a motorized bicycle. And so in order to clear that up, in order to be able to ride throughout the whole blue bike system, say you live in Morton Street and you wanna go work at Encore, and you want to ride your bike, you can do that on an electric bike a lot easier. And so this is about building an electric assist system into the bike share network, along with, to Rep Owen's point, about getting your own bike from the bike shop, riding on the pathways. This really is about everyday usage as well that we want to build into the blue bike network. Now that blue bikes are so popular in Everett, now that it's expanding to Newton, now it's expanding to Arlington, now it's expanding further south, we want to make sure that people are able to access within that network. And then to point out that Valley Bike, which is already in action in the Connecticut River Valley, is a multi-municipal regional bike share system that is electric assist already. So we just kind of want to start whole cloth and say, okay, we have solid foundations here for the bike sharing position as well. Just want to 
just want to throw that out there. That's one of the, the big things that Mass Bike pushes here as well. And, and, and I just want to add a, a point to that because in Everett, uh, you mentioned the blue bikes are so popular and, and it'd be great to get e-bikes into that system because we have a lot of development going on in the city of Everett and, and in Chelsea. And a lot of the, the developments are not getting parking permits because they don't want additional cars on the road. And because of the success of blue bikes, that is part of the, the thinking to make sure that we do not have more cars on the road and, and it can just ask you to parking issues as well. So they're not even, all these new developments that are popping up in the city of Everett have no access for parking for cars. Um, so the bike system is, is much more important and e-bikes in particular now to, to make them be their, their primary form of transportation going forward. Awesome. Yeah. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll follow up, but please, we got to get this on the transportation committee's radar um, and everybody can help there. This should be an easy pass. Like the Senator says, we're one of seven states that doesn't have this already. Um, Rhode Island's about to pass it. And they're the last one in New England besides us. Can we do better than Rhode Island? I think we can do better than Rhode Island. So I'm going to throw that one out there and say um, thanks to Steve and Sal um, and to Dylan, who can't make it. He's, he's got to deal with some storm cleanup down there in the vineyard. Um, but we're, we're super appreciative for all your work out there. Um, just to keep us moving, um, I'm grateful for our, all of uh, the support we've got going here. We have a quick video to share uh, from Rep Lay, who is going to talk about the electric bicycle rebates. Um, and then we'll pass it off to round out to Senator Brownsberger to talk some of the traffic safety work that's going on um, that he's pursuing in the Senate side. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to ask Jess, our communications coordinator, to help play the pre-recorded video from Rep Lay um, to introduce the electric bicycle rebate bill. Let's see if we can do this. Hi everyone, it's State Representative Natalie Blay from the 1st Franklin District, which includes 19 communities here in Western Massachusetts. I'm grateful to be here with you today to talk about H3262, an act relative to electric bicycle rebates. This bill is intended to support the adoption of electric assisted bikes through consumer rebates. And I want to give a quick thanks to my constituent, Michael D. Chiara, who brought the importance of this legislation to my attention because of the very specific first and last mile transportation challenges that so many communities across our Commonwealth face. This is a statewide solution to get people out of cars. One of the challenges we face in meeting our ambitious climate goals is that rural and outlying residential communities are car dependent because they have no other transportation options. This legislation creates an option by incentivizing the adoption of e-bikes. If the Commonwealth can offer subsidies and expand the use of e-bikes, we can help close these first and last mile transportation gaps in places where infrastructure cannot be built. So what does this bill do? It incentivizes equitable adoption of green technology. It motivates customers to change behavior by creating affordable options through rebates of up to $500 per purchase. It reduces carbon emissions by encouraging substitution of short and medium car trips with carbon-free e-bike trips. It addresses first and last mile transportation gaps. In rural and suburban communities, residents are not often near fixed public transportation routes. E-bikes can be used in lieu of short car trips or longer commuting trips. It encourages Main Street economic development. This will create new opportunities for small businesses and sales revenue benefiting our downtowns and generating sales taxes. It also complements state investment programs, these existing programs like Complete Streets or the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program. It provides additional tools for municipalities without increasing local budgets. This bill recently had a hearing before the Joint Committee on Telecommunications, Utilities and Energy, and we could really use your help in building support. Please contact your state representative to ask them to sign on as a co-sponsor if they have not already. I look forward to working with you on this legislation and all of the bills that are being presented here today. Thanks again for having me and I look forward to working with you on this. Take care. Awesome. Um, I'll jump in here because uh, Natalie couldn't make it. Uh, she's traveling today. Obviously, end of August is tough, but um, we're really grateful she was able to present the bill. Now, this bill has already gone to hearing. Um, it was part of a suite of electric vehicle pursuits that um, 
were, are already being talked about. So what we need to do now at this point is to really get this bill moving through committee. And the way that the machine works, as I understand it, and again, I'm still learning this and it changes day by day. Um, once the bills go uh, into the committee, then they have a committee hearing, then they go to, uh, basically if they pass through the committee, they go into readings. There's first, second and third reading where there's the opportunity to um, mark up the bill, change anything, address any questions that might be heard. And then after third reading, they get put out on the floor of the House of the Senate, depending on what chamber the bill originated in. Um, we need both chambers to support it. We need it to go through both processes parallel. Um, this bill currently is a House bill. So we need to make sure that this is also on the Senate radar of having the support so that when it does get to be hashed out between the two chambers, that they're all the questions and conversations have already been had up to this point. But right now where it is in the process is it's basically a third of the way through having a committee hearing. Um, the bills that we've talked about up to this point, except for um, Rep. Sabados's um, law that was able to be pushed for the CPA funding. Um, this is the one that's actually in committee currently and had the hearing. Um, I want to say special thanks to our team at Mass Pike for putting together a testimony in support of this bill. Um, we were able to present it to the committee didn't really get much questions, seems pretty sensible, seems pretty easy. And I also wanna remind everybody that this is about equity, not just about financial equity for low income folks, but as uh, Rep. Blay was mentioning, this is about equity regionally. We need to focus on the rural communities just as well as we need to focus on the suburban and urban communities and e-bikes help that conversation. Um, for those of you who are out there, I took a drive on Route 2 about a month and a half ago um, I saw maybe a dozen bicyclists on the side of Route 2 between Athol and North Adams. Every single one of those bicyclists was an electric assist bicycle. Why? Because it's darn hilly and everything is far and spaced apart. So for those of you who are uh, not just in the Boston Metro Eastern Massachusetts region, um, if you are out there in the hill towns, you're out there in the valley, um, please focus on this bill, focus on the electric bicycle a definition bill so we can clarify this and get as many butts on bikes as possible. Um, any other questions, please feel free to throw it in the chat. Um, I did see a question from Deborah asking about um, if this is gonna be retroactive. Um, good question, that could be something that we hash out in reading. My hunch is no, and usually these bills go into effect after they're signed into law. So this would probably, if this goes forward, be put in and then say it's starting to be effective generally the following January so that uh, mechanisms can be put into place. But that is something that we can follow up with um, and reach directly out to um, the rep to follow up with. Um, thank you everybody so far. We have one more um, legislator to throw in here. I'm gonna pass it off to Senator Brownsberger. And with that, I'm actually doing a quick screen share so we get the bill numbers up. Um, to round us out, Will has been a strong supporter of bike advocacy um, as long as I've known him in the State House. Uh, we've got two particular bills. He's got a whole suite of bills he's pursuing around road safety and betterment out there. We're going to focus today on an act to reduce traffic fatalities, which has already been through the Senate twice so far to talk a little bit about what the status is on that bill and how we can help pursue that. Um, and a newer version of a automated enforcement bill. Um, and to know that Senator Brownsberger is working on this with his colleagues, but we were able to get the Senator's time today. So I'm very grateful. And with that, I'll pass it off to Will um, to jump right on in. Thank you very much. Yeah, and if you need um, me to screen share, Senator, please let me know, we can give you access. No, that's okay. Um, I guess I, I'm not prepared to do that, but um, I do, I can, I can talk, talk through it. So I'm a cyclist. I'm, I'm somebody who spent a lot of his life commuting, uh, you know, 12 months a year um, and um, got a lot of family and friends who are cyclists. And in that orbit, you know, I've, I'm aware of many have had serious injuries and, and one personally close to me who died uh, on bike. So I'm, I'm very conscious of bike safety and, and the, the more of a, the longer any of us uh, actually ride, uh, the more conscious we become of safety. It's, it's something that um, you know that happens to all of us. We slowly become more aware of our mortality. Um, so this um, <clears throat> this this the conversation about bike safety um, really goes back a few years. Uh, we convened a group of basically basically everybody who was caring about the issue, from Mass Bike to Livable Streets, uh, and it, 
bike pad safety, vulnerable road users broadly. And um, at that time, we, we conceptualized three, I'm, I'm talking maybe this is, I don't know, January 2017 or uh, thereabouts. You know, we conceptualized three major priorities to improve cyclist and, and vulnerable road user safety more broadly. One was the cell phone bill. Two was automated enforcement of, of red light camps to increase generally traffic enforcement. And three was a collection of measures, uh, most notably including truck side guards, uh, which we have the bill to reduce uh, bicycle fatalities. So the, the first one, the cell phone bill is done. So that's good news. Um, that's, if you ask me, that may be the most important thing we can do for cyclist safety is get drivers off of their cell phones. Um, it's a terrifying thing to have people on their cell phones. Uh, when you look, you know, you're trying to, trying to negotiate the road and you look over and you see somebody who's really not engaged, uh, it's a terrifying thing. Um, so that's, that's good. And well, you know, hopefully that'll result in some behavior change. You know, nothing, nothing changed instantly. People are pretty addicted to their cell phones. That includes everybody on this phone call, including me. Uh, so, you know, behavior does not change instantly, but hopefully it gives a nudge in the right direction in a meaningful way. Um, the second piece, the red light enforcement, uh, we did mean, meaning the idea of making it possible for municipalities to uh, put up traffic cameras and use them for speed enforcement, red light enforcement, blocking the box, um, any, you know, any number of passing a school bus, uh, bus lane violations. You know, you could use cameras for a lot of different purposes. The problem in Massachusetts is that a motive, a, mo a moving violation is something that runs to the person driving the car as opposed to running to the car. You know, if, if you um, there are some things that run to the car, like parking it in the wrong place. Whoever has that, whoever's plate that is, is going to get a ticket, even if it was their friend or relative who parked the car in the wrong place. On the other hand, if somebody's speeding, it doesn't matter whose car it is, it matters who's driving it. And so in order to, to we, we can't really tell who's driving a vehicle using cameras, or we can't tell it with any reliability. Um, and uh, so we want to be able to, it, it takes legislation to allow municipalities to put up these cameras and charge vehicles for um, moving violations. This turns out to be an extraordinarily controversial proposal. If you visit willbrownsberger.com and put, um, maybe Andrew, you could throw that link in the chat while we're, um, you know, we for a couple of these things. But there are, I, I put out, I've got a couple of posts. I've been doing this for a few years. Um, and the, the range of comments on those posts, the opposition is pretty hot. Uh, and it, it, it ranges from progressive folks who are extremely concerned about the violations of privacy, that somehow uh, the fact that these cameras are going to take pictures of people that that's Big Brother watching. Um, and on the and then the other end of the spectrum, but really from the same kinds of feelings, I think, you have you have people um, who are afraid that the red light cameras are going to become cash cows for municipalities and people who are going 26 mile an hour are, are going to get a uh, you know a speeding ticket for 100 bucks and um, so we have gone to great lengths in this legislation to respond to both of those concerns to um, uh, you know make sure that the the the, camp, the photos are only going to be used for certain purposes can't be required are going to be just uh, can't be requested are going to be disposed of etc 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 on on the one hand and then also put a lot of safeguards in place so the municipalities can't go wild with with charges and you know they have to go through process and there's limits on it and so forth so um even with all of that uh, when we brought this to the floor in the senate um people really had the heebie-jeebies I mean, you know, because you know, they, they started getting phone calls really quickly from both of those groups that I've been listening to for a, you know, a few years. And um, it, 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 this was right before COVID hit. And if, if COVID had not hit, we, you know, we, we, we took it and we squished it down to the smallest possible thing, basically saying we're just going to do a pilot in a few, in a few cities and it'll, you know, it'll, there'll be a sunset on it and so forth. It was really squished down. 
Uh, and we might have gotten through, but then it was just like COVID hit. And it was like, well, we're not going to be back in a session and we all got to think about other things. And so let's not deal with it right now. So, um, and I also, I mean, and that's with me as president pro tem pushing it, right? I mean, I, you know, I have a, a, a position of some level of power on this thing, but uh, in the Senate, but uh, the concerns about that were huge. So I'm not actually too optimistic that we're going to get any place in that. Not that I've given it up, uh, but um, it's a really heavy lift. And I don't know that it's ever even had a, a run in the House. I'm sure the same things would happen if it was brought forward in the House. And I, I think that um, you know transportation shares are uh, have heard testimony against it and are reluctant to sort of start that fight. So uh, the only way this bill will happen is if there's an enormous, uh, and and when I say enormous, I mean bigger than I can actually imagine happening, uh, groundswell of support for it emerging. Um, so um, unless unless all the uh, bike and ped safety organizations decided this is what they wanted, uh, I don't see that thing moving. Um, the um, the last piece, so we have the cell phones. Huh? Um, sorry, just jump in, but I do want to give props to, in the house there is Rep Tucker and Rep Ciccolo who are also pursuing this and we'll see where it does go. Um, and I want to say that from the equity side of things, um, this is fraught because it does remove police interactions necessarily in these in some of these instances, which might make it more equitable for folks about um, profiling and bias there, but then it might lead to uh, increased enforcement as well, which which could also be inequitable depending on where these things are placed. So I want to give props to your team, specifically Andrew, for thinking this really hard and through. And Mass Bike is fully supportive of how you've drafted this. Um, and I encourage everyone to kind of dig a little bit deeper into those two issues because um, we're still figuring it out. But I, I think your team has done a really good job of, of isolating those issues very specifically and how this bill has been worded. I appreciate that. And I and I appreciate the work of my team. And Andrew Bettinelli is on the call and he's he's the guy who's done a lot of the work on this. Um, so yeah, by the way, I mean, when people talk about equity, sometimes people say, oh, well, they're going to put it only in the poor neighborhoods. They're going to put the uh, auto automated cameras in the black neighborhoods and, you know, and have discriminatory enforcement a different way. That actually is not what's going to happen. What's going to happen is these these things are only going to go up in really affluent neighborhoods that are begging for them. I mean, they're going to go up in Back Bay and you know, on uh, some street in Belmont, and, and you know, they're, they're going to go up in the places where people are really asking for them, which are likely to be affluent areas, places that are where you have affluent people living in high traffic. That's where these are going to get asked for, and that's where they're going to go first. So they're not going to discriminate against, um, you know, they're not going to punish uh, poverty neighborhoods. It's going to be the reverse. Uh, but but even when you tell people that, it's it's not a it's a very very heavy lift. Um, Last category is this is this collection, sort of a grab bag of everything else that was uh, designed to reduce traffic fatalities. Most important element in, in that, I think, are number one, the vulnerable road users bill, which is designed to say, look, you can't go, you can't drive pe by people very closely. If you're going uh, 30 miles an hour, you got to go at least three feet away, and for every 10 miles over that, you got to go another foot away. Give people a wide berth when you're moving fast, uh, people and cyclists skaters whatever it might be on the street so that's a that's an important concept and you know that's a that's a visibility thing it's, it's always best practice and most drivers do it you know but the few who don't uh need to could get a little bit of a message from this um and then the uh, requiring of safeguards and crossover mirrors you know a lot of the uh, most tragic crashes we've had in in the urban areas have been uh turning trucks um and um so the um the concept of side guards so that it's harder for somebody to end up underneath the wheels if they if a, if a truck swings around you know these long body trucks they make a right and then that body the the body of the truck moves surprisingly fast as they make that swoop um and that that has killed uh, more than one person in the boston area over the past five or ten years um so that's that's a, that's an important concept we can't really mandate it in commercial, um, you know, interstate commerce because we're just a state. We're just a, uh, we're not we're not the national government, uh, but we can at least push it on our state-owned vehicles and start to set some precedent that pushes it into uh, some of the users, although probably not the big, um, you know, interstate trucking folks. Um, speed limits, uh, lower the speed limits on on state roads. We've already given municipalities the ability to go to 25, but we haven't been clear about that um, how how that applies to state roads. One little thing that came in when we did it in the Senate 
uh, was from a motorist standpoint, somebody said, I want these cyclists to have uh, red re reflectors and lights at in the back at night. Currently, uh, reflectors are already law. Uh, that's already in the law, but this would just also add that you have some active lighting on the back, uh, which is certainly good practice. Um, so that is an overview of uh, the, the big pieces that we've been going at from a bicycle safety standpoint. Cool. Um, thank you, Senator. This is great. Um, the anoxious traffic fatalities is a, is a huge one, and you've had it twice so far go through the Senate, and we're super grateful to have that support. And um, for folks that benefit, this is also in the House uh, with Rep. Mike Moran, um, who is pursuing this as well. Um, very similarly worded, um, save a few differences. Um, one question for you, Senator, is where is this in the status and how can we help this one go through? You mentioned with automated enforcement, it's more complicated and, and you're not too hopeful. Are you hopeful about an act two strategy fatalities and where can we as, as citizens and constituents really help that along? Well, you know what? I mean, I, I, I know we can do it in the Senate um, and we've done it a couple of times. I'd love to see it go through the House. If it goes through the House, we'll get it through the Senate. So I think, uh, I think it would be great to, to put some attention on those House bills. See if you can move those, because uh, we will get it through the Senate. If that comes over, it's going through. Cool. Great. I really appreciate that. And again, we'll follow up with everybody about who to email, who to call, and what offices to, to pay attention to. And there's a find my legislator. If you don't know who your local legislators are, we recommend getting in touch with their offices. Um, the, the be all end all for this is get to know who your representatives are and ask them, you know, do they care about this stuff? Um, how can they help care about this stuff? And how can they help pursue this? Um, looks like we did have a question come through here, um, Senator, from uh, just maybe this is for any of the, the legislators who are out here. Um, does having a bill make it through a committee in a previous session usually make it more likely to succeed in a later session? Yes. Um, it, it's um, it once, you know, prior, prior having gone through once, often committees will just report things out automatically that have already been through one branch or something just to keep it going. Cool. Easy answer. Yeah. Um, and I've heard that it's very hard to get a bill through the first time. And usually it takes a couple of sessions because it takes some hashing out. Um, takes some hashing out, takes some public education. Yeah. Cool. Um, and one thing about the Anax Jeff Fatalities Bill, um, again, we're super supportive of it at Mass Bike. It creates the three foot passing, it creates the side guards, it creates a data system of bicycles pedestrian crashes, which helps our work. Um, there is a difference, you know, I will say flat out, we don't disagree on a lot of stuff, Senator, but the red light issue, Mass Bike is taking the position that we do not want it to be legally required. Um, we hand out red lights as part of our lights brigade. We are big proponents of it. Um, we're concerned about the insurance claims and how it will be enforced, knowing that bicycle um, infractions are not equitably enforced and we don't want to give another reason for a cyclist to get pulled over. Um, so that's, those are two concerns there, but we also completely concur that having a red rear light is a safety feature and a good practice. Uh, but it does come down to the enforcement side of the law's meaning versus the, the safety aspect of a law's meaning. Um, and I think that's just philosophical. I, I appreciate that we've been able to have that conversation, Senator. Um, just want to throw that out for, for those of you who um, want to get engaged with the senator on this conversation. Um, Will's also very open to conversations on his blog. So feel free to go to willbrownsburger.com and, and engage, I think is the key here. Engage with your representatives. Um, I also want to mention with an act of fatality, it's not about us. It's about anybody who's out on the road. It's about tow truck drivers. It's about state troopers writing tickets. It's about construction workers filling potholes. Um, and the administration is also very supportive of this. And the governor's road safety bill mirrors a lot of what the senator's bill has as well. So there is general consensus that this is a wise way to go about traffic safety um, and will save lives. It will flat out save lives. So um, with that, I'm, I'm super grateful to have your, your pursuit and your champion in the Senate here. Um, with that, are there any other questions for, for Will or any of the others? I just see in the chat the idea of could we simplify to make just five feet the uh, standard? I mean, I. I don't have a problem with that. I agree with you. It makes it a little bit complicated to, to have the, uh, I'm, I'm responding to Deborah's question, uh, to have the multiple, um, you know, the concept of how fast are you going? Just, you know, five feet would be a better rule of thumb. So I think that's, that's Andrew, I think that's 
something we should kind of keep keep on the radar screen uh, as a as a possible change there. Cool. Um, with this, I mean, I realize we're at one o'clock, and I'm I'm actually again super grateful for all of your time um, for all the reps and centers who took time in August to spend an hour with us. I do want to open it up if anybody wants to stick around. Um, being cognizant of everybody's time, we are about three minutes over where we should be. But with that, um, thank you to Rep Savadosa for getting the bill out and getting that straight through through law, for Rep Fatolo for being here, for pursuing the, the commuter benefits, and let's make sure that we can get reimbursed for how we're actually getting around the state. Um, to Senator Domenico and Rep Owens and Rep Fernandez for pursuing the e-bike pursuits, uh, for Rep Blay for pushing the e-bike incentive program, for Senator Brownsberger for making sure our roads are safer. And I hope you get a sense of the suite of issues that Mass Bike is trying to tackle here. There's a lot of variety with how we're pursuing our legislation this year. And we also want to recognize that nobody is doing this in a vacuum. Um, it does take influence, impact from constituents and everyone else. So um, feel engaged and we are not driving this conversation. Um, we're relying on you as our members and our constituents and also our champions at the state house to make sure that this, this loop gets closed. Um, so we're super grateful for that. And we'll just keep the chat open. Feel free to unmute if you want to chime in at this point. Um, and again, go to massbike.org slash legislation for updates. Go to massbike.org um, to become a member and keep in touch with us on our social media. Uh, and then bike month's coming up next week. So get out there and ride um, to all of your abilities. And um, again, I'm just so happy and so grateful to have our champions at the State House. And I look forward to the day when we can actually beat the, the, the halls, those marble halls and actually meet in person. I miss those days of so just hashing it out out there. So um, good to see you over Zoom at the very least. Cool. I'm gonna stop the recording as since we have stopped the formal uh, part of our agenda. Thank you, Jess. <laughs>